So good afternoon, I'm Chris Cooney, President of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. It is my pleasure to wish you a very happy Valentine's Day and welcome you here to the combined meeting of our Government Affairs and Good Morning Metro South committees. We want to thank Thorny Lee Golf Club for hosting us today. In addition, uh, I also want to thank OCES and Stonehill College for sponsoring today's program. Lastly, I do want to uh, recognize uh, UMass Boston. Uh, they sponsor our yearly uh, Legislative Affairs Committee, and I know uh, Phil uh, Carver is here today from UMass Boston. I saw him come in. Phil, give us a wave. Thank you, Phil, for your support of the committee's work. At this time, uh, we would like to ask all of you to rise as we salute our nation's flag. And now to sing our national anthem is Nikki Mead Draves. Nikki is a business consultant focused on marketing and community relations. Uh, she serves clients throughout the Metro South region, and uh, we're delighted to have her here. She has a wonderful voice as well. Nikki? <laughs> <laughs> She's also a, a wonderful writer, too. Some of her poetry is just amazing. So much. So many talents. So one person. <laughs> so at this time, please join me in a moment of silence as we remember our servicemen and women for their dedication and enduring service to our country. Thank you very much. I'd like to recognize the elected and selected officials who are with us here today. As I call your name, please give a wave. Uh, please hold all of your applause until I'm finished reading the list. If I missed you, please let me know and we'll announce you at the end. We have uh, with us State Representative Claire Cronin. In addition, we have representing uh, Plymouth County District Attorney Tim Cruz. We have uh, Mayor Bob Sullivan on his way. I think he's just coming in now. Uh, with him will be his Chief of Staff, Kerry Richards. Uh, Troy Clarkson is here representing the City of Brockton, our new CFO. Tina Cardozo, City Councilor uh, at Large, is here with us, as well as Rita Mendez, City Councilor at Large. Dennis Iandieri, City Councilor of Ward 3. Jeffrey Thompson, City Council of Ward 5. Jack Lally, City Councilor at Ward 6. And our City Council President for this year, Shirley Asak. Uh, we also have with us uh, Donna, Dottie Fulganetti, chair, she's the chairwoman of the Board of Selectmen from the town of Easton. And we're delighted to have with us as well from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce joining us today, Stephen McAllister. Now let's have a big round of applause for all of them. <laughs> we are also honored to have as our guest, Congressman Joe Kennedy III. We look forward to hearing uh, from him on his thoughts uh, regarding a number of current topics concerning business and community uh, issues and priorities uh, today. Uh, let's give him a warm welcome to Brockton. As he 
know the congressman represents many of the communities, not Brockton, but many of the communities around here, including uh, Easton and Freetown and Berkeley and Lakeville, uh, where you'll find a lot of uh, former Brockton residents uh, uh, you know, living in those areas. So we're delighted that he's here with us today. Uh, now I would like to draw your attention to the pink sheets on your, the middle of your table. Those are not uh, anything to do with finding a date or Valentine's Day. Uh, what, what they have to do with is if you have a question for the congressman, he has agreed to answer uh, questions as time allows uh, from the audience after. So if you have a question for the congressman, please write it out on the pink form, hold it in the air, and uh, one of our chamber staff will be around to pick it up. It is now my pleasure to introduce our MC for today. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, with us the president of Bridgewater State University, a local boy named Good who grew up here in the city of Rockton, uh, Fred Clark uh, from the Easy Chair of our board. Fred, come on. <laughs> thank you very much, Chris. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Kennedy, thank you all for being here today. Um, I want to also thank our Bridgewater table over there, and we have a couple new people I want to just introduce very quickly. We have brand new to the campus, former State Senator Vinnie DiMacito, who's helping us to connect Bridgewater to employers, to the region, to help our students. Vinny, thank you for being here. And also, uh, Dr. Mary Grant. Dr. Mary Grant has been a president for 15 years. She went on to become the executive director of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute, and she's helping us to connect our university to social justice and civics education causes, already doing a wonderful job in week number six. Mary, thank you for being here as well. I want to wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day. I hope everybody remembered today was Valentine's Day. I hope you're off to a better start than I was. Normally, I start with either candy or flowers or a card in the morning, but my wife beat me out of the house this morning, so I'm already off to a bad start. She left me a note, and in the note she said, it's happy Valentine's Day. It's been a blissful and happy 23 years of marriage. Have a great day. I thought that was really nice, until I remember we've been married for 33 years. <laughs> so she just got some flowers delivered to her just now. I'm sure she's very happy, and I have to be sure to thank the person that sent it to her, wherever it might be. I think we're okay. February 14th, other than being Valentine's Day, is also a special day in the history of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. It's our anniversary. It's our 107th anniversary. And in 1913, um, we had our Articles of Incorporation approved by the legislature. <clears throat> Those original articles are on display at the chamber offices in the Edison Building. But in those articles, uh, and I'll, I'll quote, uh, is this, uh, these couple of sentences, and quote, the purpose of the corporation shall be to promote the commerce, trade, industry, and public interests of the city of Brockton and New England, to promote and regulate a commercial exchange in the city of Brockton, to acquire and disseminate business information, to establish and maintain uniformity in commercial usages, and to promote just and equitable principles of trade, end quote. The chamber has been fulfilling that mission for 107 years, from then till now. And perhaps at the beginning of this new decade, we can take, take stock of our hopes, our mission, and a, our collective efforts as we go forward in this region. Brockton is truly well positioned, as is the whole region, to benefit from many of the topics and initiatives being discussed today in the United States Congress from infrastructure investment to trade negotiations, from higher ed financing to immigration reform. This year ahead is sure to get us all thinking about what is most important to our businesses, to the employer community, and to the future of this city and of this region. Topics like this are the reason that we're all here today on a beautiful Friday afternoon at a golf course having lunch. It's um, also a pleasure, speaking of here, to be here at the Thorny Lee Golf Club to have such a wonderful facility host our conversation. Thorny Lee itself has a terrific history. Many of us in the room know the history. It was established in 1900 as a private company of friends, and in their own words, who built a motley array of holes on Brockton's west side. Over 25 uh, years, the members added to their property, and by 1925, the full 18-hole 
course was in place along with a clubhouse that fit its times. By the way, Brockton has more golf courses than any gateway city of the 26 gateway cities in Massachusetts, and uh, it's a point of pride. In anticipation of the club's centennial in 2000, this clubhouse, the new clubhouse, was constructed and, and used by members in the community, and we use it quite a bit. I, I think I've been here, this is my fifth or sixth time, just in the past couple of months. We're grateful um, to, be, to be here. The club installed a new irrigation system, which greatly improved the condition of the golf course. Not necessarily your game, however, but uh, definitely the condition of the course. By the way, I'm waiting for the ponds to freeze over, then I'm going to play, just so I won't lose any. The club hosts a number of tournaments, and I didn't know this, including the road to the LPGA Symmetra Tour, awarding more than $125,000 in prizes to the top women golf, uh, golfers qualifying for LPGA play. And I understand the club's general manager is with us today, Ed Hadfield. If you, are you here, Ed? Yes, I'm right here. Oh, Ed's right here. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Brenda Karens. Do I have that right, Brenda? Did I say that right, Karens? Community Program Director at the Old Colony Elder Services Organization. The mission of OCES is to support the independence and dignity of elders and individuals with disabilities by providing essential information and services that promote healthy and safe living. She's a great partner to all of us, and she is a next level multitasker. She oversees the nutrition program, the volunteer program, the healthy living program, and the family caregiver support program. She holds a Bachelor of Business Administration and Finance from the University of Texas. Additionally, she holds a number of certificates from our friends at Boston University. I'd like to have uh, Brenda come forward, and Brenda will be interviewed by one of our board members, Masa Kambabe of Kambabe Immigration Law. And I want to say about Masa, we hire her at Bridgewater. She's not only a terrific immigration attorney, she is a national leader in regards to the promotion of all things immigration law. We are extremely proud to have her on our board as well. Masa and Brenda, please come forward. One of the issues is um, how to support working caregivers. 
there's two things that came out of this that are really important for employers. Because as the state of Massachusetts has also said this is important, um, there's an employee toolkit and the caring, the caring company guide. And those two um, documents are available on the internet, if you look under MBR. And the first thing that comes out of them is there is a survey that you can give to your employees so that you can determine how many working caregivers you have. And the second one determines their needs. We at OCS have already um, given those surveys to our staff. And we have a family caregiver support program that works with caregivers, including working caregivers. And we've been doing that in the past for many, many years, and we continue to do it. Um, some of the stats are there are more than 840,000 residents in the Commonwealth that provided care to an adult in the last 12 months. A recent study found that informal caregiving cost mass employers over $982 million in one year. That's a lot of money. It's a big cost. And that's due to increased turnover, absenteeism, and presenteeism. I had to look that word up because it's not something you normally hear. Um, the data makes it clear that the emotional, physical, and financial impacts of caregiving requires public and private partners to think differently about supporting working caregivers. Today, the title of family caregiver go, it, it encompasses about one in every four people in, that are working in America. And one of the things that I found most interesting is the millenniums, age 18 and 39, it encompasses one in three of those. And you look at that generation and they're already caring for kids mostly, but now one in three of them are also caring for an older adult. And I was trying to figure out why that was and then I realized that I'm in the big work <laughs> era and I did my career first. I was in the financial corporate world for quite a while and I did not even think about having my child until I was in my mid-30s. So then I looked and said, okay, when my child reaches 40 or in his late um, 30s, I'm gonna be in my mid to later 70s. So I was like, whew, <laughs> that's why these young kids that are already taking care of their children are now also taking care of older adults. And it's something new that's coming up and it's really important that employers address that because that's really stressful. <coughs> um, one of the things that Old Colony is doing is, like I said, we have the survey that we gave to our staff. We have it in SurveyMonkey. We're willing to share that with people if they want to survey their staff. We have had our family caregiver support program working with caregivers for many, many, many years. And they also work with care working caregivers. We have actually gotten calls from companies through their EAB programs um, to actually work with caregivers. So we do have large companies that have some like caregiver that goes to them and says, I need some help, and they do call us. So we've gotten referrals from there. But we can do one-on-one -on -one consultations. We can do phone consultations. We can do lunch and learns. We can do education seminars. There's just a lot we can do. So. Um, I encourage you, if you're interested, to talk to us. Um, we have actually a family care specialist with us today, Nancy. Um, so if you're interested in talking to us, it's really important that everybody understand the importance of working caregivers and where it's going from here. And the fact that the Caregiving Coalition and the State of Mass have made it a priority to support the working caregivers, we all need to work with that. So I see you have a fantastic table here of uh, staff from OCS and that you were all recently involved in something a little bit fun and on, you were on a commercial on HGTV. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, we did this easy answers for marketing, but that it goes a little further than that. OCS has our staff out in the community. Um, we do networking. We go to lunches like today. We have collaborations with partners. And when we're out there, we've realized that most people know or have heard of O'Colony Elder Services, which we now go by OCES because of the different populations we serve, but they don't know what we do. So our development manager and our CEO got together and they decided to come up with some 30-second commercials. We did three different ones. The first one is our CEO, Nicole Long, talking about OCS and what we do and what populations we serve. The second one talks about adult family care and what we do, the work we do in the community with them. And the last one's one I want to talk a little bit more about today. It's family caregiver support. We call it Audrey's story. Audrey was, a, or is a caregiver for her husband, Ralph, 
Ralph had um, some memory impairments. And so she came to OCES because she was looking for some help and some guidance. And one of the things we did for her was send her to a conference that Tifa Snow was having. And if anybody has been to Tifa Snow, you know she's really good. She's very motivational. She talks about caregiving. And she's a person you can listen to all day and enjoy the conference. And that's kind of rare sometimes. Um, but another thing we did for her is we bought a lightweight wheelchair for her because we do have some funds from grants or from donations that we can use to help our caregivers out. And it was a quality of life issue is why we ended up buying the wheelchair for her because she needed a lighter wheelchair. She and Ralph had basically become isolated at the house because the wheelchair was too bulky and heavy for her to get out. Um, so it, it helped them get out. It just changed their whole quality of life and put a smile back on their faces. Um, the other thing we did for her is that we, we actually got her involved in our music and memory program, which is a great program for um, caregivers that are caring for somebody with dementia, Alzheimer's, or uh, memory impairment because the program, we, we talk to the caregivers, we download information on iPod, our songs on iPod, on an iPod, and we also give them the headphones and speakers. We give it to them all free of charge, and it helps relieve some of the agitation that comes along with dementia, and it also, we've had um, some of our patients that have gotten it, they'll start singing with the songs that they listened to 30 or 40 years ago. And so it's made a big difference in the caregiving um, that they do. So OCES, um, we are helping people to, to do that. But um, it was great doing those commercials, and we hope that everybody learns a little bit more about it. Thank you very much, Brenda. For those of you who'd like to learn more about OCES, you can look at the, up their website. It's OCESMA.org. And thank you again, Brenda, for coming and sharing the information with us today. Thank you very much. Brenda Karens, thank you very much. <clears throat> Masa, stay right where you are. We have another sponsor of today's program, Stonehill College. Stonehill College, as everyone in this room knows, is a Catholic institution of higher learning founded by the Congregation of the Holy Cross. It has more than 2,500 undergraduate students enrolled, and it has a really spectacular, beautiful 384-acre campus located very close to here at a former Ames estate. Joining us today to say a few words and be interviewed by Masa Kanbabi is Reverend Father Denning. Reverend Denning is the 10th president of Stonehill College. Come on up, Father. It's okay. <laughs> He's been in this position since uh, 2013. A priest in the Congregation of Holy Cross, Father Denning came to the college in 2000 and has served as the Director of Campus Ministry, Vice President of Mission, Vice President of Student Affairs, and by the way, he reports to a higher authority, and I don't mean the Board of Trustees. That, that's my higher authority. Under his leadership, though, the college has undergone a truly major renovation and reorganization with the establishment of two academic schools, the Leo Mann School of Business and the Thomas and Donna May School of Arts and Sciences, with an investment of $55 million in the construction of state-of-the-art buildings. He has overseen the physical transformation of their main quad on campus. In addition to his tenure, the college has introduced graduate degree programs in integrated marketing communication, special ed, and data analytics, as well as new majors in performing arts, data science, health science, earth and planetary science, special education, along with a new minor in digital humanities. And I do want to mention, because we're very proud of it, um, with Bridgewater State University, we have together created with the state of Massachusetts a photonics engineering integrated training center for southeastern Massachusetts. That kind of collaboration is a wave of the future. And I do want to say I like this. <clears throat> The Father's uh, favorite passage is from the Bible, from Hebrews 13, 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have unwittingly entertained angels. And I think you're probably talking about people in this room with that passage, Father. Masa Kanbabi, thank you. So Father Denny, it's been seven years that we've been blessed to have you at Stonehill and in the community. 
and I'd like to hear a little bit about what you consider your greatest achievement. <coughs> Thanks, Masa. And uh, I just want to thank Fred and also uh, the Chamber. It's great to be with you. Uh, and also Congressman Kennedy. I had the good fortune of meeting Congressman Kennedy seven years ago when I became president. And uh, I remember a question he asked me that I think really embodies the work he's done. Uh, he said, how can I help? And I think as a congressman from our district, he certainly uh, has done that for the college and for all of us. So, just grateful to be here with Congressman Kennedy today. You know, one of the things uh, about Stonehill is we were founded in 1948 by priests and brothers of the Congregation of Holy Cross, the same religious community that founded the University of Notre Dame. And one of the characteristics of that is the education of both the mind and the heart. And I think that's really embodied every day at the college. Uh, we really at the end of the day want our students and our alums to think critically to act with a spirit of courage and uh, to lead with a spirit of compassion, as our mission statement says, to create a more just and compassionate world. And I think that fundamentally, uh, that's what we do every day. And we try to have our students really be engaged citizens, both uh, on campus and beyond. So it's, uh, it's probably what I'm most proud of, uh, the work that we've been doing since the school was founded in 1948 and continue to do today to really have young men and women who are truly active and engaged citizens. And I can attest to that. I have met many of the staff and teaching uh, staff and individuals and students, and they've been amazing to work with. So um, you have a really great team. Now, there are a lot of challenges facing institution of higher education these days, and what do you think some of the greatest ones are at this time? Fred, do you want to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of, the, uh, one of the great challenges of higher education is affordability and accessibility. And, you know, whether it's at a public institution or a private institution, uh, we all work to have a college education be affordable for our students. And we do that um, by providing financial aid, uh, by helping families make higher education reality for their, for their children. I think one of the greatest challenges that we face is around affordability. Now the second, I see especially uh, where we find ourselves in New England, the Northeast, uh, there's a declining demographic of college age students, traditional college age students, 17 to 22 year olds. And so in a very competitive market, um, it's important that we differentiate ourselves, uh, we speak to parents about the value of an education uh, and how that will lead to lives of success and fulfillment. Uh, but we do that in, an, um, in, a, in a market that for traditional age college students is really declining. Uh, probably the third area of real challenge I think is the uh, mental and emotional health and well-being of our students. Uh, I talked to them about how important it is to sleep, to put the phone away, uh, to really develop those skills, those talents, and resiliency, uh, to really face some of the challenges that they confront. You know, at Stonehill we speak about the education of the whole person, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, um, and so it's important that higher ed finds a context to do that well, uh, so that our students really do develop the skills, the resiliency, uh, to grow intellectually, spiritually, ethically, and, and emotionally. And uh, to have that sense of spiritual well-being, I'd say. So those are three areas I see as challenges for us in New England and in the region, for especially uh, in the education of traditional college age students. Yeah, things have changed a lot, and many more challenges facing young children and young people these days with the internet and social media. Now, um, I've had the pleasure of living in Easton now for 10 years and getting to know Stonehill and its programs and Martin Institute and uh, think that there are many great programs, but what are some of the ones that you'd have liked to highlight about Stonehill? First, I, I just want to say a word about photonics. Uh, Fred and I in a partnership with MIT, I mean, this is really great for our region. You know, the southeast of Mass, uh, it allows us to do some, develop some programs in engineering, optics, laser. 
please don't ask me any more about the tonics, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, but it's really good. It's it's about helping the workforce here, and that's really critical. Um, so. Fred also mentioned, you know, we just opened the Mean School of Business. Uh, great gift uh, from Leo Mean, who's an alum of Stonehill, CEO of W.B. Mason, uh, his partners, uh, the Green Brothers, um, and the people who work at W.B. and also our alums who've really contributed to really help to transform our academic quad, and especially that building, along with the Thomas and Donna J. May, uh, May School of Arts and Sciences. It just has transformed that center of academic learning starting a women's ice hockey program. So uh, that'll be next year. We're excited about that. They'll be playing uh, over at the Bridgewater Ice Arena. So that's happening. Um, and then in just a couple weeks, the students go on uh, spring break. And a lot of our students will serve to uh, participate in a service immersion program, which we call HOPE. And uh, they'll go down, and some will work in Peru at one of the schools sponsored by the Congregation of Holy Cross in Lima. Uh, others will serve in areas throughout our nation, and uh, so they'll be going internationally, domestically, to serve, but most especially uh, to learn about our neighbor and to meet our neighbors, especially those who are facing economic challenges, uh, economic struggles, to learn of their hopes and their longings, and um, to come back and bring that knowledge, and hopefully that will impact their own learning in the future and how they really become those engaged citizens that we uh, hope happens in the lives of our students. Well, Father Denning, thank you. We look forward to hearing more about the good work that you'll continue to do. And please accept this pen as a token of our appreciation. And thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Stonehill. Thank you very much, OCES, as well. <clears throat> it's my pleasure now to introduce our special guest, Congressman Joe Kennedy III. As a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, Joe's legislative agenda is driven by the needs of families. He is fortunate enough to represent. He has worked to expand, and I can attest to this, STEM education to underserved students, fortify community health centers, increase legal assistance for low-income families, and end discriminatory practices in health care, and also bring down monthly energy bills for hardworking families. Joe has established national leadership on the issues of mental health and substance abuse. He has led legislative efforts to strengthen mental health parity laws, expand Medicaid coverage, and ensure that all children and pregnant women have access to mental health treatment. In Washington, he has prioritized the economic development and the rich manufacturing tradition of the 4th Congressional District here in Massachusetts. He's an advocate for vocational technical schools, public higher education, higher education generally, and the region's emerging clean energy industry. His Perkins Modernization Act and STEM Gateways Act, which focus on expanding educational opportunity to middle and working class students, were both just recently signed into law, as well as his Revitalized American Manufacturing and Innovation Act. From immigration reform to LGBTQ equality, Joe is truly a passionate advocate for civil rights, as well as a proud voice for a living wage, worker protections, and economic justice. I want to just say, personally, I had the good fortune to work for another Joe from Congress, Congressman Joe Moakley, for 18 years. And when I first met Joe Kennedy, we were greeting him at Bridgewater, and we had a big delegation of high-profile people at the end of a hallway Lining that hallway were our maintainers and campus police officers. And um, as I observed him walking down that hall, he made sure to shake hands with every single maintainer, police officer, before he got to the dignitaries. And I thought to myself, he has the right stuff. As I said in South Boston uh, many years ago when I first started, you got to keep your feet on the ground. His feet are on the ground. With humility, hard work, and honor, we're proud to recognize and have speak Congressman Joe Kennedy III. Fred, thank you. Um, I think they've said other things in South Boston, too. Um, <laughs> we'll leave it at that, though. Um, I am grateful uh, for the invitation, for 
your leadership for the uh, opportunity to come back um, to have had the opportunity on a number of occasions to uh, visit the school and um, for your friendship and partnership. So please, anything I can ever do, I'm grateful for it. Um, Chris, thank you. Um, honored for me to be back uh, once again, to have this opportunity to engage with all of you, give you a couple words, and then take as many questions as we possibly can. But I will say, as somebody that's had uh, the good fortune to represent uh, part of the region that you cover for the past now seven plus years, to get a firsthand look at um, how this or organization and the partnerships uh, that go through it uh, advocate for Metro South is um, exactly the right uh, way to do it and exactly what we need more of. I am grateful for your leadership and your invitation. To my uh, fellow elected officials that are here, um, to uh, Mayor Sullivan, who I know was here and I think had to step out uh, briefly, to a number of the uh, city councilors that are here, as well as Mr. District Attorney, um, uh, uh, Chair Fulgatini, thank you wherever I saw you before. Oh, there you are, excuse me. Um, to my dear friend, Claire Cronin, Thank you, as always. Um, I'm going to echo the comments of uh, Fred and Chris. Masa is an absolute treasure. Um, I have had the uh, good fortune to work with her and sometimes um, the urgency to have to work with her as um, we try to fight to protect um, immigration laws for folks that need that protection. Um, and she is as talented, as tenacious, and as dedicated as you, an advocate and activist and lawyer as you will find. So Masa, thank you. And Father Denning, as well, always a pleasure to be with you. I appreciate the, uh, what you have done at Stonehill, and uh, which echoes, obviously, well beyond the walls of the institution. So thank you, sir. Uh, folks, I'll jump right into it. As small business owners, as community bankers, as educators, as healthcare providers, realtors, and so, so much more, you know exactly what it is that this region needs. So I'll do my best to keep this short and then hear from you as to how I can support your efforts. It's almost three years ago, as uh, Chris reminded me, to the day since I was here uh, addressing all of you before. It seems in many ways uh, like just yesterday, and in many ways like decades ago. Tom Brady was celebrating his fifth ring and not playing with our emotions. <laughs> Mookie was in Fort Myers, where he belongs. <laughs> My daughter Ellie could not walk or talk, and now my wife Lauren and I do nothing without her permission, which is interesting. <laughs> the president was on his second national security advisor less than a month into his administration. They said, simpler times. <laughs> on a serious note, when we spoke back in 2017, it was a few weeks after President Trump's inauguration. We were debating, wondering what his election meant and how we would lead this country. And to a certain extent, we still are. But one thing was abundantly clear then, as it is now, that Americans in every corner of this country felt deeply, emotionally, and personally that our system was not working for them. The economy, our health care, immigration system, our environment, our climate, on education or justice. All of it, or most of it, felt broken. And many of the flaws that, are, uh, that we find are intertwined and interwoven in a way that demand deep and systemic change. And reflecting on that moment, I kept revisiting conversations that I've had in recent years with people across this district, across your region, across our Commonwealth, but also in my travels as a member of the United States government in Arizona, in Pennsylvania in West Virginia, Minnesota, Texas, and a whole lot of places in between. People who read about a 3.6% unemployment rate, but have little difficulty rattling off a list of relatives, neighbors, coworkers who have been laid off or left behind. Patients who see record low uninsured rates, but are among the 17 million insured patients who skip filling a prescription every year because they still can't afford it. Workers who hear that the Dow is closing in on 30,000, but count themselves among the nearly half of all Americans who don't own a single stock and don't benefit from an off-sited arbitrary threshold. Young adults who read that home ownership is the way to accumulate wealth, but live 
in one of the 80% of metro regions where home prices are rising faster than their wages. Recent college graduates were told that there are 7.6 million unfulfilled jobs. If they just stopped being so picky, they could find them. But wages, when controlled for inflation, are lower than they were when their parents started that same job search. Student loans having them, have them paying off a mortgage without the house. The Social Security fund they're paying into might not exist when they become eligible for it. The refrain reverberates across state borders, party affiliations, and demographics. I read those headlines, but it's not my story. It's not my family's story. It's not my community's story. Even as we hold up Massachusetts as an example of economic vibrance, progressive values, innovation, and civic strength, we have to confront the fact that that's not the story for all of us either. Today, the average household income for a family in Fall River is roughly $40,000 per year. And even though the average salary for a plumber would be nearly double that income, there are more CEOs than plumbers in this state. And if any of you ever need a plumber, you will find that out very quickly. <laughs> the Voc Tech schools that we are so proud of provide a pathway to those jobs, have a wait list of over 3,000 students. Today, in Boston, nearly 60% of our schools are intensely segregated compared to 42% at the turn of the century. Many of those segregated schools are also determined to be underperforming, while schools with predominantly white students exceed expectations. Today, the net worth of a white household in Greater Boston is $247,000. For African American families, it's eight bucks. For Dominican family, zero. This is a story being told by the vast majority of Americans. It's the uncertainty and the inequity undergirding the anger and anxiety that we feel permeating a political process, civic discourse, and our ability to coexist with those who might look or think or act or vote differently than we would. For too long, we have a system that has worked on overtime to convince American families that Basic livelihood is a zero-sum game. That there is scarcity amongst our society's most fundamental building blocks, from good schools to clean water, to jobs, to food, to health care. And the cost of providing access to everybody is just too high. Not everyone can make that cut. And then we're surprised when people turn on each other, take from each other to ensure that it's their family that survives. Folks, this is the challenge of our time. The problem that we must solve before we can solve for anything else. And let me be clear about this. This should not be a political issue. I do not view it as one. Because the scars of that anxiety and injustice appear on the left and on the right. On the fringe and right down the middle of the center. We see it in the activism of marginalized communities that have been forced to fight for opportunity that they should have been guaranteed. We witness it in the pocket of a country that put their faith in Donald Trump because they believed that a system was so broken that you needed a wrecking ball to come fix it. That's why many of you have heard me talk about it. structural reforms to our capitalist system. A system grounded on the idea that the way this country measures economic success is outdated obsolete and out of touch, but understands that our capitalist system has brought more people out of poverty than any other system in humankind, or human times. GDP and stock prices and profit margins are important, but they don't measure the contributions lost by a broken immigration system, the lives taken by dirty air, dirty water, or extreme weather, the pain of unchecked student loan debt. The productivity stolen by an education system as segregated today as it was in the 1970s. The harm caused by a housing crisis that stretches from Roxbury to Springfield. Or the injustice of relying on GoFundMe pages to afford addiction treatment. 
Those are the cross currents of today's economy. They are mighty, they are entrenched, and they are deeply embedded across all of our public and private systems. Confronting them, I believe, will require a government that is willing to take on economic business as usual, so that it is our workers, our families, our main streets, our small businesses, and proud communities like the ones we share that will drive economic policy, not powerful interests that often operate an ocean away. We have to, we have to address and redress economic abuse so that bad actors can't gamble away American wages, bank accounts, housing security, and retirement money. We have to have a system that is a fierce guarantor of economic protection so workers can seek redress when they're being exploited or abused. We must be a reliable supplier and partner of public goods because health care, child care, roads, bridges, schools are things that no American family can survive without. We must mobilize our economy around collective national, nat excuse me, national interests. Our people, our planet, basic economic security not the interests of those with power and access to tilt the system. And yes, I think that does mean big structural change and a lot of it. But it also means the pragmatic, immediate reforms with a, that have a powerful impact on everyday lives in communities like ours. It means fighting for things like a Green New Deal that matches the urgency of a planet in distress, while immediately creating an independent environmental justice office that responds to frontline communities that have been forced to bear the blunt of pollution and climate change. It means continuing on a path, toward, path towards universal health care in a state that has 98% of people covered with health insurance already, while immediately demanding that insurers are held accountable for violations of existing mental health law like mental health parity. It means debating issues around the cost of higher education while immediately increasing Pell Grants for students struggling to afford that education. It means pushing a system through immigration reform while defending our neighbors under temporary protective status from deportation. It means working tirelessly to get weapons of war off our streets, recognizing that today is not just Valentine's Day, but the two-year anniversary of a massacre in Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida, and immediately passing red flag laws that protect our families, our schools, and law enforcement. It means moving our country closer to universal child care and immediately investing in our public schools. And it means partnerships. It means listening. It means a government responsive to its people. Which is why I'm here today. Because yes, major policy decisions that confront us are made by elected officials in our capitals, state houses and city halls. But those of us that hold these offices, we're often too reactive, responsive, or reflective, rather than proactive, shoulder to shoulder with leaders that are gathered here today. So I'm back here again three years later to ask once again for your insight, for your partnership, for your honest feedback, today and every day in the months ahead, to understand what big systemic change looks like to you, how it translates in the daily lives of our neighbors and families and friends, that you work to empower every single day. That it's their perspective and your perspective that needs to guide our way. I'm grateful for your work and look forward to being a committed partner that continues to show up, listen, and try to do whatever it is that you tell me to do as often as I can. Thanks very much and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Congressman. I know we have some questions for you. For some reason, these are all dated yesterday. No, I'm only thinking about that. 
Uh, are there any more questions out there that we didn't get? Okay, we'll take those forward. Hold on. Offshore wind. What are your, are, are your views on moving mass in USA off of fossil fuels? So, I'm sorry. No worries. Um, we've been working really hard on trying to create a platform for um, offshore wind development off of the south coast of uh, New England, particularly parts of my district. Um, this was actually going around relatively smoothly um, and working fairly closely with uh, the Trump administration up until uh, July. Oddly enough, the, uh, the former Secretary of Interior, uh, Ryan Zinke, was a, uh, served in, in the House with me. We had actually a pretty good relationship. Um, and the permitting process was moving forward for some of the big projects out there, most notably uh, Vineyard Wind. And then all of a sudden, um, it still was stopped in its tracks. We've been working, um, doing everything we can, actually working with the Baker administration, with our colleagues in the House, um, across the aisle, some of the, the contracts that uh, Vineyard Wind was engaging, uh, because this industry does not exist yet in the United States, uh, some of the vessels that were gonna be needed in order to actually get these, uh, the wind turbines in the water and in the ground, uh, were coming up from the Gulf, um, from places like Texas and Louisiana. So we were working with a couple of our Republican colleagues represent, that represent the Gulf Coast, and the equipment that was used for offshore drilling to try to actually um, get this project up and running. Um, we have been met with uh, a new Secretary of Interior that has essentially blocked that progress. Um, he had required, he asked for more information um, for the first time back in July. They just, six months later, just indicated to Vineyard Wind what additional information they're looking for um, after a six month delay. Um, there's been other auctions that have taken place. We are have an enormous capacity for offshore wind. Vineyard wind, that project itself was enough to power, is enough to power 400,000 homes with clean, renewable offshore wind energy um, and be a absolute game changer for investments in places like Fall River, New Bedford, and along the entire south coast of New England. Uh, so that twist has been um, frustrating. We continue to work with our uh, my colleagues across the aisle and with the Baker administration, um, given that impact that this can have as a growth of an entirely new industry and with US-based jobs and education systems that are necessary in order to train up those workers. Um, I think it can be a, uh, a huge lift for this region. Um, we're working through some um, challenges that haven't been entirely clear, unfortunately, as yet. But. Thank you, Joe. There's a couple of questions um, regarding the infrastructure bill and where is it in the process? Infrastructure week. Yes. Uh, so, it seems like every week's been infrastructure for the past couple of years. So, um, the some of you might have been following this. Um, the chairman of our um, in the house, the house chairman of the infrastructure committee, the transportation infrastructure, um, just released a uh, nearly eight hundred billion dollar um, proposal about uh, ten days ago that tried to outline what a uh, one proposal could potentially look for. Congressman Richard, uh, Richie Neal uh, has been one of the leaders on this in his, as his position of chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and his engagement with um, senior White House officials on a number of issues from taxes to trade to, um, to um, any source of uh, revenue generation that would be needed for a major investment in transportation infrastructure. He is still pushing pretty hard on it. We, uh, some of you might remember about a year ago, uh, about a year ago, we were actually pretty close. The, there was a, a team of folks, Speaker Pelosi, Chairman Neal, a couple of others, had gone over to the White House, had an initial conversation about a roughly $1 trillion infrastructure bill. Some of those numbers pushed up even higher than that. They, both sides were gonna work on something. They came back um, for, uh, to the White House for the follow-up meeting and um, I'll just say things went off the rails rather quickly. Um, and there haven't been substantive discussions since. Um, this is a big priority for us. This is a huge priority for me. This is an issue that, as you heard me talk about some of those economic statistics, we now, I, I think all of you know and you feel, we have the worst commute, Boston has the worst commute in the entire country. You have that commute because 
the economy of Boston's going like gangbusters, but it's forcing people that if you can't, if you don't have a six-figure job, you can't afford to live there, and you're being crossed out, and so you're moving out, but still commuting into work. And we haven't made the investments in public transit in order to actually provide people to have that pathway in, or the investments in regional economic development to adequately provide uh, release valves to some of that economic growth to grow regional, like Worcester, Brockton, Fall River, Taunton, Lawrence, Lowell, Springfield, and others. Uh, Worcester. Transportation infrastructure is critically important uh, source of funding for that. So it's a it's a big priority for us. It's a huge priority for Chairman Neal. Uh, this one takes um, three to tango, if you will, to butcher the, 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 the metaphor, but um, not only do you need the leadership out of the House, which I think actually does have a commitment to this, we need the President, which I think he actually uh, might be inclined to do it. The challenge we co confront on this one is actually more out of Mitch McConnell, um, who was not eager to um, find a way to spend $800 billion in this way. <clears throat> Congressman, we have a talent shortage in Massachusetts of, I think, historic proportions. Immigration reform is- I see a pretty talented room. room. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right. What will you do? <laughs> Immigration reform is uh, part of the solution. What's your sense of uh, where we're going with the Congress in terms of immigration reform? Fred, I don't have a good story for you on this. This has been one of the most frustrating pieces of, uh, of policy that I have worked on over the course of the past seven years since I've been in office. Um, I think many of you know this, but uh, when, I got to, uh, when I got to Congress under uh, Obama administration, still a Democratic Senate, Republican House, uh, there was a big push for a comprehensive immigration reform bill. Um, the, in 2013, uh, a deal had come out out of this gang of eight, four conservatives, four uh, Democrats that, across the spectrum from conservative to, to progressive, that actually came together on a, on a proposal. That came out of the Senate with nearly 70 votes, a veto-proof majority. Uh, we actually did a whip count and had the votes to pass it in the House, had it come to the floor, had Republican leadership enabled us to have a vote on it, it would have passed. And Speaker Boehner blocked it. Uh, there's not been another comprehensive bill that has had a chance to get to the floor. We had a chance um, a year, a little over a year ago, uh, after the end of the midterm elections in Christmas, before we went into the largest government shutdown in history, which was again around immigration, for those of you that remember. Uh, we had the votes to pass a bill that protected DREAMers, TPS recipients, and deported veterans. Members of our military that served community that served our military without proper documentation and have been deported. Um, and so we had the, the context of a deal set for them and um, we couldn't get it on the floor. Once again, we had the votes to pass it. Speaker Boehner wouldn't put it on the floor. Um, this is something that has become a um, hot button issue for some of our conservative colleagues. We have put forth, as when Democrats <coughs> control the House, we have passed bills that do those things for DREAMers, TPS recipients, Board of Vets, uh, Mitch McConnell is not willing to take a look. So uh, we will keep pushing. Um, it's um, it has been frustrating because when we don't have answers to that question, that's when I do get the phone call from Masa on I have a family. What are we supposed to do? What can you do? And the heartbreaking point all too often is not much. Uh, and the impact of what that means for a community, not just uh, in terms of a lost job or lost revenue or lost tax dollars, but as that just starts to pull apart the fabric of communities, um, that was it. Thank you for your leadership on that particular issue, Joe. Um, you mentioned the anniversary, the two year anniversary of a horrific set of circumstances in a K-12 environment. And maybe this is the third question in a row that has an answer that's similar. But where, where do you think we are on gun control in this country? Um, we're at where we were a, a year ago. Um, we're 
little bit further uh, forward, Fred, in that uh, we did one of the first bills that was passed out of the Democratic House were reforms to uh, close uh, loopholes that can be used for folks to, to get hands on uh, on weapons. That, uh, so gun show loophole, private sale loophole, other uh, universal background checks uh, that um, can try to tighten up the ways in which people that shouldn't have access to guns do have access to guns. Uh, again, there is no, um, I've heard nobody indicate that that's going to be an area where Mr. McConnell's uh, interested in actually moving a bill forward. Uh, so you want to be dependent on states to try to continue to, um, to push forward um, and save up a lot. Uh, and um, look, I have had, uh, to tell you, I, um, it is awfully hard to meet with um, high school students um, who have watched their um, classmates be killed in front of them, to meet with parents um, that um, two years ago today, uh, two years ago last night, one of those kids was asking his dad's advice for flowers to buy his girlfriend when I went to school today. Um, and he started getting calls um, right after the reports of the shooting, uh, after reports of the shooting uh, started becoming public. And he frantically called his son, and he never picked up. And come in to see you and say, what can we do? And That's a very hard conversation. Um, and so we will <clears throat> continue to try to do whatever it is we can do. Um, what is, I think, particularly frustrating about this one is that 90% of the country actually agrees on understanding with humility that there's no one single policy that is going to prevent those episodes from taking place, but there are things that we can do to lessen their likelihood. Um, we are not the only country in the world where people have guns. We're not the only country in the world where people have mental illness. We're not the only country in the world where people work school kids, or students go to school. We seem to be essentially the only country in the world where that happens. And there are things we can do to limit that prob probability, and yet our government cannot. Um, and that's a very, um, that's a very tough conversation. That's an honest and passionate answer, Joe. Thank you for that. I want to uh, just, I think we have time for two more questions. Okay. One more question? Okay. Um, so maybe two more questions. There you go. <laughs> okay. So, so on a hopeful note, uh, and I'm going to read this exactly as it's written. I'm not able to vote yet. I'm in the seventh grade. What can, we, what can we do as youth to help affect change in the region? By the way, this is in Troy Clarkson's handwriting. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. What's your message of hope for the, for the young people coming up? So, um, I don't want to make my answer uh, political, but I, I think this actually holds regardless of the political ideology that you, uh, that you subscribe to or ascribe to. Um, this upcoming election in November, the consequences of, the, of this are going to be monumental in a way that either from a democratic point of view, you can course correct from the policies put forth by the Trump administration, or for the supporters of a Trump administration, you can double down for four more years on a pathway forward that you see a widening gap between uh, some of the core tenets of what parties believe, although you see, a, uh, I think, a Republican Party that is actually uh, ahead of a Democratic Party in this, in terms of a reinvention of what, as a, you have a country that is in, a, in transition economically, politically, socially, demographically, a Republican Party that's actually further ahead in that reinvention than a Democratic Party. Um, and so this is our chance for everybody to actually take, to seize this moment and opportunity and actually help define the pathway forward for the next generation of American government, of American politics, and the trajectory of a nation. And you got like ten, or eight months, nine months left. But you got nine months to actually set the trajectory for the most powerful nation in the world. 
And the way that you do that is you get involved in campaigns. You knock on doors. Super Tuesday's coming up in three weeks. There's a whole bunch of folks in those races. Super Tuesday and what, whoever wins in Massachusetts matters for who is, who's going to be a Democratic nominee. And the moment after that one, there's a whole boatload of other races that are coming up, whether they're here, state house, state senate, city council, whether they're senate races, house races, whether they're up in New Hampshire or in Pennsylvania or any other place in between in a general election. But if you had nine months, if somebody told you that you had nine months to actually influence the trajectory of the most powerful nation in the world if you took advantage of it, what an incredible opportunity that would be, particularly now. And the last piece on that, particularly if it's a younger person asking that question, you are going to be wrestling with the choices of this election for a generation. The choices that are made about what government engages in and what we don't. Healthcare, student loans, climate, a job, basic aspects of economy, retirement security, how you gotta pay for your kids, your life, and your parents. I'm not gonna tell you who to vote for on any of those things, that's not my job. But my request would just be that you actually dive into this because this one matters. And I hope to take advantage of that chance. And last one, this is the last question. Um, people, voters want to know your position on issues. They want to know your heart. But they also want to know what kind of a person you are. Could you give us, give us a window into life in your home? How do you spend your free time? What are your kids like? Is your wife your boss like mine is? Those are the things people want to know. Do I have free time? No. If, like, if anybody thinks that running this first statewide election while having two little kids gives you free time, like, sorry, you're wrong. You want a window into life? I got back at like, I got back after 10 o'clock last night. Came up from DC to Springfield, um, and then back home. We live out the right by Boston College. Um, I'm away and off a lot. At these times, I dawned on me that it was in fact Valentine's Day. Um, we had a four-year-old little girl who came in um, uh, at one in the morning, wide awake. I got kicked out with her uh, to a guest bedroom. She came back in. After at three, she said she wanted mom. I said, great, hey, mom. Uh, she then got up at six, came in, woke up dad, because why not? We went downstairs. I made breakfast for them and for my wife, brought that up. Um, Happy Valentine's Day, honey. She said, why'd you do that? I went to bed an hour ago. <laughs> Life. There you go. That's the toughest part of all. Thank you, Thomas, for joining me this day. All right, as, as the congressman heads out, we have some, a few uh, announcements for you, chamber updates very quickly. Our fifth annual Multiculture and Business After Hours will be held on Thursday, March 5th at the Fuller Craft Museum. Special edition Good Morning Metro South, March 27, Friday at Massasoit Community College. Taste of Metro South, Wednesday, April 29, this year at the Greek, Hall, uh, Greek Church Hall on Oak Street next to the Fuller Craft Museum. A listing of all of our events and upcoming workshops you can find on our chamber website. And we have some door, tri uh, door prizes as well. And I don't know if I have the winners here. Can you get the winners? Is it in here? All right. This is important stuff. Is it in here? All right. Here's our winners for the door prize. Each morning, Good Morning Metro South randomly selects one company to be highlighted in, up in an upcoming action report and this today's winner is Matt Fenlon, UMass Boston. Good job, UMass Boston. All right. Our first door prize is a $50 gift certificate to Brax Grill and Tap. I've been there many times and the winner is Jason Hunter, Mass Hire, Greater Brock Brockton Workforce Board. Second door prize is a Stonehill mug and Plymouth 400 hat. And the winner is Karen McGuire, Southeastern Regional Vogue Tech. Good job, Karen. Yep. We have a third door prize from OCES. It's a mug and journal, and the winner is Suzanne Fernandez from Northeastern Savings Bank. Awesome. Um, there's a uh, 
thorny lead tumbler mug in the center of your tables, and each person at the table with the birthday closest to today will take home that centerpiece. Fight it out amongst yourselves. And everyone enjoy treats. Everyone enjoy, uh, everyone's asked to enjoy treats and coffee over near the buffet. We want to thank uh, our today's ambassador team, Robin Howard, CNC Design Studio, Brockton Community Access Channel, The Enterprise, OCES, Stonehill College, UMass Boston, Masa Kanbabe, Thorny League Golf Club, and finally again to Congressman Joe Kennedy. Thank you all for being here.